Good afternoon. I'm Michael Javen Fortner, a senior fellow at Niskanen and associate professor of government at Claremont McKenna College. Today, I'll be moderating a conversation about a phenomenon called homicide impunity. That's violence in communities that goes unaddressed. We will discuss the origins and consequences of homicide impunity, particularly the impact unsolved homicides have on families and neighborhoods. Unfortunately, I have a personal connection to the topic. My brother was murdered on the streets of Brooklyn, New York. He was stabbed to death after a block party. The crime was solved, the offender went to prison, but the pain remains today. It never leaves. I cannot fathom what it feels like to endure that pain without any resolution at all. Today, we will explore what that pain feels like, what it looks like, and its implications for democracy. And we have an amazing panel to do that. I will briefly introduce each as I bring them into the conversation. Lisa L. Miller is a professor of political science at Rutgers University. Lisa, your work has been an inspiration to me. You have helped me understand that violence is an important variable to think about in political analysis. What brought you to the study of violence in democratic politics? Thank you, Michael, and thanks to the Niskanen Center for this event and to my co-panelists. Um, I started studying crime in the 1990s when I worked on my dissertation. And I thought I was going into communities to learn about policing and problems with policing and, and the justice system. But in fact, all anybody wanted to talk about was violence, um, guns, uh, getting dangerous people off the streets. More police uh, was something I heard a lot. And that was very surprising to me. And it really reoriented my thinking about what a lot of urban communities were, were dealing with, were facing, and sort of what kinds of demands people were making um, of the city and, and, and the state. And so I ended up writing about the problems of violence in a lot of communities and, and how um, homicide in particular was um, you know, a focal point of political organizing. And that organizing was around not just um, wanting police but also wanting to to ameliorate the conditions that get, give rise to to more violence in the first place, and so I there was sort of this cluster of demands that people were making um, that were really around questions of of violence, and then I kind of doubled down on it. I think as as uh, as the crime wave kind of receded, coming into the twenty first century, and and criminal justice reform really came on the political agenda, which is great. Um, but violence kind of fell off of the, the radar a bit, both in terms of, of, I think, research, but also just political, politically. Um, and that, that worried me and concerned me for really the, a lot of the reasons you just mentioned, Michael, which is um, you know, the incredible, incredibly devastating impact that, that homicide and, and particularly persistence, persistent homicide and unsolved homicides have in, um, in many communities in the United States. So I, I, then I became very interested in why the United States has such high rates of homicide relative to other affluent countries and why, why African-Americans in particular suffer from such um, high rates of victimization and such, um, you know, uh, uh, and from this problem of homicide impunity. Thank you. Jeff Asher is a nationally recognized data analyst with expertise in evaluating criminal justice data. Jeff, um, I'm going to ask you later on to drill down in the data a bit more, but for now, um, what brought you to, to the study of violence? Um, and what's your impression of the role that violence and homicides play in our society today? Yeah, thank, thanks for having me. Um, I am a New Orleans native and have was in DC uh, working for the Defense Department and CIA for uh, a bunch of years and was moving home and looking to basically apply my analytic skill set to something in New Orleans. And New Orleans is a place that has had persistently one of the highest murder rates in the country. Uh, every year since I was three years old, New Orleans has been in the top five in terms of murder rate nationally. And it's also a place that in a lot of areas, but especially in, in policing and crime and gun violence, does not think about it. It does not collect data. It's not a good city 
in terms of doing anything beyond the anecdote in a lot of ways. Um, and so for me, I was fortunate enough to, to get a position to be able to uh, begin to at least learn uh, what, what are the drivers of gun violence here? What are the drivers of murder? Why is it such a persistent problem? And it, it's, it's a real failure um, in New Orleans for, for generations in terms of failure to collect data, failure to ask the right questions, failure to analyze amongst all the other failures. And so um, as I, I've been a consultant for the last five years and that mission of trying to, to under, better understand, better collect data um, beyond just New Orleans, but nationally. And as we talk about um, murder and especially murder clearances, what are the questions that we're asking? What's the data we're collecting? How are we analyzing it? How are we understanding it? Uh, these, these are the same questions that, that plague New Orleans, that plague nationally. And so, uh, for, for me at least, it continues to be a very difficult analytic challenge on top of the humanitarian tragedy and all of the other uh, aspects of, of, of homicide and gun violence. Thank you. Wesley Lowry is a correspondent at CBS News and a contributing editor at the Marshall Project. Wesley, what brought you to this topic and can you walk us through some of the data and some of the narratives you encountered while reporting on this issue? Sure, well, I'm happy to do that. Um, you know, so I've been covering issues of race and justice for about seven, eight years now. Um, you know, beginning in Ferguson, Missouri, uh, following the police killing of Michael Brown. Um, and I spent years, 2014, 15, 16, uh, primarily writing about uh, killings at the hands of police officers, police shootings, and beginning and overseeing a data collection process uh, for that information, which is remains lacking at a federal level, um, even this many years later. Um, but as we're doing this work, uh, former, a friend and former editor of mine, Julie Obi, came out with a book called Ghetto Side. Um, and in her book, she posits that the greatest civil rights issue of our time is the failure of the police to solve the homicide of Black men. Um, and, and, and that the, and that there's no greater way that a society can say that black people's lives do not matter than for the, for the society to permit those lives to be taken criminally without any recourse, without it being stopped and without the killers being brought to justice. Um, that that's in a way a means of the government saying that these people's lives uh, did not matter. Um, and so as we are finishing up some of our police shooting reporting, I was really interested in finding a way and, and looking at um, if this was something we could scale and look at in a bigger and broader way. Uh, Jill's book, Ghetto Side, focused on Los Angeles particularly um, over a period of years, but looking at how uh, the homicides of black men would go unsolved while homicides of other people would be solved. And, and, and so what we did is we launched a, a project called Murder with Impunity. And in that case, we started with 55 major cities. I think we eventually got up to 65 major cities um, where, and we got 10 years of homicide data. Now that, that sounds, you know, uh, I can make the argument that that should be very simple data to give. That if a, that a police department should have a list of the murdered people in their city or in their town, certainly should have it for recent history, but I can make the argument they should have it Forever, I should be able to go to the, DC, the Metropolitan Police in DC and ask for a list of the people who were murdered in 1922. It's a static list of people's bodies, people who were murdered, right? And ostensibly, if the murder was never solved, it should still be an ongoing and active case in some way. And, uh, but that was not the case. It was remarkably difficult to get this information. What we asked for is we wanted um, the names of the victims, some basic demographic information, uh, but then most crucially, uh, the latitude and longitude, the address, the place where this person was killed. And second, if an arrest had ever been made. Um, in many cities, parts of the data sets have been released, but never all of these things together. What that allowed us to do was it allowed us to create maps for each of these cities going back a decade that were not your normal homicide heat maps. Here are the dangerous parts of town, but rather were maps of impunity. These are the places in town where if you are killed, your killer will never be brought to justice. Um, in many cities, there are places that are relatively violent, but where a fair amount of homicides result in arrest. There are other places that are relatively violent where no homicides result in 
right? Places where murder is functionally legal inside of that city, right? Because if something is a crime on the books, but no one is ever punished for committing that crime, it is functionally uh, legal to do in that, in that space, in that society. Um, we then began doing reporting on the data, running the numbers, and I'm gonna look up some of them to just tick by them, but also talking to real people, uh, talking to police, to detectives, to victims, to people in the neighborhoods kind of working the streets a bit uh, to get a sense of what is different in these zones, in these places with high impunity and how are they different from places with very low impunity. There are also places in uh, most of these cities where if you are murdered, it's very likely uh, that you uh, will have your murder solved or someone will be arrested for it. Um, and, and, and so we, we did that reporting I and mean, we also tried to look at how the failure to solve homicides potentially leads to additional violence. Um, that in a world where, um, and, and how you begin to have a chicken and egg issue um, with violence begetting not just violence, but then the, but unabated violence leading to a lack of trust and legitimacy in institutions, which then make it less likely that witnesses will cooperate, which lead to more <laughs> murders that go without arrest um, and, and the process continues. Our, uh, the top line numbers we have, so like I said, we ultimately looked at uh, more than 50, 55,000 homicides um, over the course of a decade in 55 cities. Um, you know, about 50% of the homicides resulted in arrest, 50% did not. Um, and so to begin with, at the highest aggregated all the way up, it's a coin flip if your murder is uh, results in arrest in the United States of America, in a major American city. Um, the 68% of the cities, so the majority of the cities, almost seven in 10 of the cities, have a lower homicide arrest rate now than they did a decade ago. Um, police are getting worse at solving homicides. In again, in major American cities, very well-funded police departments that have seen their budgets grow over the last decade. Um, the uh, black victims account for the majority of homicide victims, but they're the least likely of any racial group to have their killings result in arrest. Um, and what we found is that in high impunity areas, places where there are a lot of murders and very few are solved, almost exclusively exist in poor black neighborhoods. Although not every poor black neighborhood is a high impunity zone. Um, and, and what we also saw is that two thirds of the homicides that resulted in an arrest, uh, two thirds of homicides, um, two thirds of solved homicides had an arrest occur within one month. And so if someone is going to be arrested for killing you, that arrest happens within a month of the time you were killed. Um, for cases that, um, and, and then if for the cases that remain unsolved one year later, only 5% of them ultimately lead to an arrest, right? And so trying to look at and complicate what we know about whose homicides are being solved, what circumstances they're being solved under, um, we've all kind of locked in this idea of the first 48, and we found that that's a little, that there's, there's more space than that. Um, um, that, but uh, that the longer something sits, the less likely it becomes that homicide ultimately results in arrest. Thank you. Roxana Altholz is a clinical professor of law at Berkeley. Roxana, you written an amazing report on this subject, a tragic report in, in many ways. Can you tell us one, how you came to this issue and two, Walk us through your findings, the, the data, the narratives that you encountered. Um, I'd like to start by offering my condolences, Michael, um, for the death of your brother. Like you, um, you know, homicide is part of my family. The report is actually dedicated to the Martinez family, Rolando Nano Martinez, who is the brother of my partner and the father of my children. And so partly this was uh, an effort to honor his memory and, and the ongoing grief and mourning and celebration um, that we undertake in our family um, to keep Nano's spirit and memory with us. Um, and, and I just wanted to share this one dedication to a human thing, love, a holy thing, to love that which death has touched. So the love does not end with the death. Um, so I am a human rights attorney. I've had over two decades of experience practicing as a human rights attorney and conducting research into human rights violations. My expertise is mainly in representing the family members of victims of forced disappearances, massacres, torture, and extrajudicial killings and litigation before international court and bought 
courts and bodies. Um, much of my work has gone to address um, gross human rights, serious human rights violations in Latin America, specifically Colombia, Guatemala, Honduras, and Mexico. And I'm so amazed at how we're, the concept of impunity is starting to permeate kind of academic and policy discussions in the United States. That's a significant change. When I saw Wesley's work under the title of impunity, I was just amazed um, for very long. That wasn't a concept that was well known in the United States. So I wanna take just a second to say what impunity means as defined by international human rights law. Impunity is the systemic failure to prevent violence, to investigate and to provide support and assistance to family members of victims of homicide violations. So what does impunity have to do with unsolved murders in Oakland, which is what my report is about? I was interested in using the concept of impunity to examine the the lived experiences of family members of homicide victims in Oakland. Now, of course, Oakland is not war-torn Colombia or Bosnia, and the vast majority of Oakland homicides are committed by um, private actors, non-state actors. And, and in fact, since the 1990s, Oakland has had some of the highest rates of violence in the, in the country per capita. Oakland's homicide rate has consistently been three to six times the state and national levels. And for those of us who live in the Bay Area and have lived in Oakland or in California, we're used to the portrayal of Oakland as a high crime city. Um, and we often talk about high crime neighborhoods, but we much less off, um, discuss and much less address um, that those neighborhoods also have high rates of victimization. And I should say that that is despite the fact that in Oakland, like in many other cities, there are networks of community-based organizations that have been working tirelessly for decades to provide assistance to, and support to victims and their families under really difficult conditions. So because my work has been focused on human rights perspective of the victims, that's the perspective I was most interested in for this study. So in the last decade, approximately 76% of Oakland's homicide victims have been Black. And during that time period, police made arrests in approximately 40% of Oakland's homicide if the victim were white, were, were Black, and 80% if the victim's, um, victim was white. In East and West Oakland neighborhoods where most of the city's Black families live, police made an arrest in less than a third of the homicides. And so you have high rates of violence, low arrest rates, and you have more than 2,500 cold cases on Oakland's books. So declining clearance rates is a nationwide issue and that's garnered the attention of journalists and academics and policymakers. But much of that research has been on the factors that influence the nationwide trend or the factors that make it more likely that a homicide will be solved. The research tells us very little about what it's like to be a young person who's gone to 19 funerals of friends and families, or to be a father like one of the Oakland residents I interviewed, whose son, the mother of his son, his nephew, and his brother were all killed in separate incidents, and all those murders have been unsolved by Oakland PD. Um, so I was interested in using this concept of impunity to move beyond the question of why a murder has not been solved, which I think is a very difficult question to get to empirically, and to focus on how family members experience the unsolved murder. And Wesley's work is really influential for this study. So Wesley mentioned that um, you know, he looked at more than 50,000 homicides, 26,000 of those, ho those homicides, more than, I'm sorry, 26,000 of those homicides have not been solved. In more than 18,600 homicides, so 71.5% of those unsolved homicides, the victim was Black. So the experience of impunity in the United States is most familiar to Black victims and their families. African Americans, especially Black youth, are at a disproportionate risk for exposure to violence and trauma 
Nationwide homicide is the leading cause of death for African Americans between the ages of 10 to 34. And Black youth are 7.8 times more than likely than whites to experience the homicide of a loved one. And on average, African Americans experience a homicide of two loved ones in their lifetime. So the voices of victims and survivors of crime, especially Black crime victims, are often missing. Um, from the public safety and justice debate. My study seeks to foreground the family member's perspective and insights with the aim of identifying policies that more effectively address the needs and experiences of family members of homicide victims. For family members living with impunity in Oakland, what are our findings? What does that, what is the experience? It's meant lackluster police responsiveness often disrespectful and discriminatory treatment, checkered of availability of services and restrictions on who can take advantage of government support and assistance, stigma and safety concerns that go unaddressed and are often exacerbated by the criminal justice system's very cramped notion of justice. In cities like Oakland that have stark racial disparities and arrest rates for homicides, the systemic failure to solve murders sends a powerful message about the value of victims to society. And I'm happy to go into any of the other findings in more detail, but I think I should stop there. Thank you for that. Lisa, you uh, used the term concept racialized state failure to help understand the origins of some of the outcomes that Roxana just um, outlined. Um, can you walk us through what you mean by racialized state failure and its connection to these issues? Yeah, I was struck by um, a couple of things, both Wesley and, well, all, all three panelists said actually, I mean, Wesley and Roxana's comments about, you know, the implications of homicide impunity for, for social trust, for political legitimacy, for feelings of inclusion or exclusion, for feeling feeling you know like part of the political community or not being excluded from the political community, and I think that you know what's interesting is that that you know social trust and political legitimacy are two um, two things that a lot of scholars who study sort of macro level homicide rates and sort of nation states see as causes. Of, of violence as sort of partly part of how why people engage in violence and lethal violence to resolve conflict is partly rooted in a in a, a sort of larger processes of um, of inclusion and exclusion or or, or, or you know, lack of trust and and, and delegitimacy. So um, whereas I used my, my earlier work was really focused on kind of community level politics, I've become much more interested in sort of state building and state capacity and state level processes that. Um, might mitigate some of the conditions that lead people to, to engage in lethal violence as conflict resolution. And I've, I've written about the United States as kind of a failed state in that regard. So if we think about security from, from the homicide as a sort of fundamental obligation of the state, um, you know, the United States is faring really poorly in relation to other democracies of our sort of wealth and development. And it's, it's, it's faring particularly poorly with respect to African-Americans. I mean, colossal failure, you could say, with respect to the risk that African-Americans experience. Um, but, but it's true for, for, for the United States um, generally. I mean, you know, people of all racial groups, incomes, demographics, regions are at a higher risk of murder in the United States than they are elsewhere. So, so I've been thinking about what, you know, what sort of state processes and state, state building and state capacities might, might matter. And um, the, the concept of racialized state failure is rooted in sort of two features of the American political system. One is the very fragmented institutions that we have that make it hard to get things done. We're seeing that right now. Um, and that sort of make all of this variation across the country. Um, you know, Jeff mentioned New Orleans and Louisiana, which is, you know, one of the, has long been one of the most violent um, regions of the country, but but many of the Southern states are, are significantly more violent than, than other parts of the country. And there's the uh, kind of, you know, state failure at the literal level of states. Um, and so the failure of, of the states, to put it crudely, the failure of the states of the former Confederacy to, to be held accountable to their citizenry for all kinds of risks, including, uh, including violence. So, 
so the, the concept is kind of rooted in, in the, so the nature of American political institutions, but the racialized piece is that um, state building and state capacity are sort of persistently disrupted by this virulent um, white nativism that, that doesn't want to use state capacity to benefit um, non-white people, to put it simply. Um, and so there's this sort of continual disruption of efforts to, to uh, uh, build state capacity in ways that might both prevent murder, more homicides in the first place, and also produce the kind of justice system that could bring people to accountability when violence does happen. And I just want to add, because um, I because I think it's I think this concept of, of impunity that, that both Wesley and Roxana are talking about is it's really, really brilliant and important. Um, and and I, I think that the feedback, positive feedback loop potentially between um, you know, violence and unsolved homicides um, uh, is important. But I think there's a way in which this happens on a, a, a larger scale too in the United States. You know, I mean, there's just zero accountability for gun violence in the United States. I mean, zero, there's, there's, there's no gun laws. There's no gun, we, we, nothing, we, we've time and time again, right? We're, it's like this, this repeated failure, it's repeated state failure to actually do something about the volume of firearms in this country, and, the, and and that's not the only reason we have higher rates of homicide, but it is staggering to watch the 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 national government repeatedly fail at this, and and that it, that has a lot to do with the nature of our our political institutions and these ongoing efforts to disrupt state capacity and state building in ways that might might minimize um, uh, violence broadly, but particularly the toll it takes on African Americans. Thank you, Lisa. I'm going to return in a few to the to the broader question of politics and what we do and the political constraints that we might face when trying to deal with this issue. But I want to drill down a bit on the data and see what state failure looks like um, in, in many places in terms of um, homicide clearance clearance rates. Um, Jeff, can you talk a bit about what you found um, on this issue in terms of both the drivers of violence, but also our ability to solve those crimes? Well, I, I think for me, it, it starts with sort of the nonsensical way in which we ask police departments to collect this data and report the data. Um, the, the way that, that Wesley and Roxana talked about how you, you know, what percentage of murders were solved by an arrest makes total sense. But that's not how police departments actually report clearances. Uh, the way that they report clearances is the numerator is the number of murders that they solved either by arrest or by exception where they think they know who did it but that person's dead or they're in jail in another state or some other reason that they think they know who did it but they can't arrest that person so that's the numerator regardless of any year that those happened and the denominator is the number of murders that occurred in that year so you get really wacky numbers like last year in 2020 costa mesa california reported two murders and 34 murder clearances for a murder clearance rate of 1700 percent um and if that's true then they solved basically every unsolved murder that they've reported since 1975. so you get the, these weird numbers that don't actually reflect performance but reflect how they're reporting the data and how they're collecting the data what portion of these were cleared by exception? What portion of these were cleared by arrest? That never is reported to the FBI and never really collected by the agencies in a, in a systemic way. So that's your first question. The second question is whether or not any of the data that the FBI reports is, is really reliable. And usually at a national scale, it, it is, but you get really weird fluctuations agency to agency. So like New York City went from 86% murder clearance rate in 2019 Last year, they reported to the FBI a 27% clearance rate, and they reported publicly a 50-something percent clearance rate, but that's not what they told the FBI. Uh, LAPD, at about the time that ghetto side was happening, they reported a 38% clearance rate in 2010, 39% in 2011, 60% in 2012, and then 108% in 2013. So did they suddenly start solving every murder, or was something weird happening in the data? I think it's the latter, but it's hard to say. Um, and then we're basing our clearance rate numbers on uh, everything but 
a whole bunch of agencies don't report. So Chicago does not report clearance data to the FBI. Puerto Rico does not report clearance data to the FBI. So that's the second and third largest police agencies in the country. We're, we're basing our national estimates on that. Um, and then I think it's worth reporting. We, we sort of talk about reducing clearance rates, how clearance rates nationally are going down, but we don't acknowledge the degree to which the numbers the FBI reports are sort of a guess. Um, and if you look at the, compare the percentage of murders, that, the number of murders that the FBI is saying it's basing its rate off of and the rate that they're giving, in the 90s, the late 90s, early 2000s, you're looking at low, high 60s, low 70s percent of actual murders that they're making their guess on. A couple of years ago, it was 90 percent. Last year, it was 83 percent. Same thing in the 60s where you're, you're pre-Miranda. They're talking about a 90 percent clearance rate. Um, so for, for me, at least, it's, it's a question of what, how are we defining it? We're defining it in a way where uh, you know we've got some people that are doing great work that that are that are reporting numbers that make a lot of sense, and but the national collection measures make no sense in how we're reporting it. Um, and then I think for me at least the the final answer is you know if as a research question if we ask police departments and if, if police departments actually put in the concerted effort and solve more murders over time, will that lead to less violence? And I think that that's the, the thesis of Ghetto Side, that it's it's critical. I think it makes a ton of sense and it, it should be a policy goal. It's not inherently something that we have a lot of academic level research that really backs up. This is a policy that departments need to do because we know that this will lead to less violence in the future. There's lots of reasons to solve murders and there's lots of reasons that agencies should be putting more resources behind solving murders we don't inherently have the evidence that this is a gun violence murder reduction strategy, though it makes a ton of sense that it should be. And I don't know how we answer that question without going back all the way to the start and collecting better data and having police departments be more open about what they're collecting. And, and Wesley is absolutely right that this, is, this should not be difficult to collect this data and report this data. This should be publicly available data just as you've got officer involved shootings, misconduct, all of this information that police departments are starting to report in open data, what happens, how many murders there are, how many shootings there are, and whether or not these shootings and murders are getting solved should just be publicly available. And in a sense, in a sensible world where we're going at this problem in, a, in ways that make sense, that's what we'd be doing, but we're not there yet. So we have um, state failure everywhere, um, not just in our inability to protect people from from violence, but the state's ability to be, to to keep basic information about violence um, and, and and crime and death. Um, Wesley, can you talk a bit more about the consequences of this state failure for people's understanding of? their own citizenship, their own um, connection to a broader political community? Of course. I mean, I, I think that, you know, my fellow panelists have made a lot of good points and I'm going to just kind of piggyback on them and string them together. Um, and so this is my floating citation that all everything I'm about to say has already kind of been said by the smarter people here. The, you know, that you think about at a very basic level, a, a society, a, a country, a, a place, and the social contract we enter with a government, the agreements the we, we pay taxes, we follow certain sets of rules, and in return, we expect a level of peace and safety um, that we receive back. Uh, what we know is that in the United States of America, there are large swaths of people, large sections of municipalities, uh, where that promise is, is systematically not delivered. People who pay their taxes, who live in our society, who are not kept safe, um, who are victimized at rates that are much higher. Uh, so first of all, you, you already have a, a failure there. Uh, but second, the promise that we are made is that when, if and when we are victimized, that the government and society will seek justice on our behalf and for ourselves and, and for our family. Um, but what we know is that these SWATs, these populations do not receive. Uh, so they failed the second time. Uh, but third, I think as, as Jeff was noting, we, rather than deal with the fact that our report card on such a very basic 
function of our society rather than deal with the fact that we are failing by those measures. We are, you know, throwing the report card out before we get home from school. That it's remarkably difficult in, in most places to receive, to find accurate, reasonably chronicled information about these vital functions of government. That there's, there's no crime you can commit greater against another person than taking their life. Um, and, and yet, we, despite having the best financed and largest police apparatus in the history of mankind, fail as many times as we succeed at providing justice for the victims of the worst crimes. And that is true even as we have advances in technology, cell phones, cameras, right? None of these things um, ha have, have been able to breach. Uh, the failure. One of the reasons I think that it's interesting, and as I think Jeff noted correctly, you know, we don't have a ton of academic data. Now it's hard, right? That would be hard data to ever get, in part because you're trying to prove a negative. Did did the did the doing of a good thing create an absence of a bad thing? Um, which already, as a functional question, is a difficult thing to start getting at. You've got a caveat in there, nuances, right? But but you could start. Look, but one thing to look at is you know, and we've done this kind of quantitative journalism and research, you know, talking in neighborhoods uh, to people who live in the places where homicides are not solved or the families of people whose homicides go unsolved. Um, and what we also look at and what we can also look at is what is present in the cases where homicides are solved and what is absent in the cases where they are. Right. So again, the vast majority of homicides that are solved do not involve much casework at all. You show up at my home, I'm, I'm holding the knife and the body is next to me. Um, I, you show up at my home and my last text message is, I can't believe I just killed grandma. Um, you show up at my home and my surveillance camera shows me killing grandma. Once you factor out all of those cases, the cases that do not involve police work of any, any substantive amount, and you start looking at other cases, right? You have cases that get solved because of technology. They find a camera, they find a text message, and you have cases that get solved because of eyewitnesses. And, and that, and what we know about eyewitnesses, the willingness to come forward, to speak to the police about things that you have seen, and, and then to testify in court about those things. We, we know that there is some connection to how those potential witnesses see the legitimacy of the police and the effectiveness of the police. If you, and how there can be some chicken and egg there. If I live in a neighborhood where murder is commonplace and I live next door to a murderer and you show up, someone who never solves any murders, who wants me to give you intimate information about the murderer who lives next door to me, I'm going to perhaps not politely ask you to get off of my doorstep and hope that no one has seen you here, right? And, and so we, we know that there can be a fatalism and an apathy that on the one hand, can, can continue to lead to unsolved homicides. But on a second hand, right, when a government, when the police are failing to provide this basic component of the social contract to provide justice, that human beings want justice. If you kill my brother, I believe he's entitled to that justice. If I have no expectation that the government, the system is going to do that, I, there, be, there comes a point for a certain subsection of people where, where it makes more sense and it's the only thing that makes sense to procure that justice themselves. Um, and we see this in police departments frequently where you have shootings that begat shootings that begat shootings. And it's not that anyone called 911 because they got shot up, they went and drove and shot back at the person. Why? With, with that decision-making, I mean, we could sit down and try to interview them and put psychologists in the room, but the functional decision-making is that the, the most expedient means of securing justice is by doing it themselves. Roxana, you bring a, a, a very important um, comparative and international lens to, to this question. Um, can you talk about how this, these, these questions of, of citizenship and an individual's relationship to the state plays out in the context of um, impunity? So, I mean, I represented hundreds of um, human rights, victims of human rights violations. So 
uh, individuals who were victimized by, by the state. So usually the military, the police, tortured, executed, massacred. Um, in Oakland, you have a different situation, right? So you have private actors perpetrating the violence. And what I expected was when you're a victim of a human rights violation by the state, it shatters your sense of belonging and citizenship. And I was, I was quite impacted by the way I saw similar dynamics in Oakland, even though the perpetrators were private actors because of the systemic nature of the impunity. So individuals would talk about um, feeling stigmatized, shame. So I use the concept of disenfranchised grief to examine um, the effects of impunity in Oakland. So there's this notion in Oakland that, you know, you're of the undeserving victim, of the culpable victim. So if your child was killed, he was probably up to no good. And that permeates kind of um, at a cultural level, um, um, the family's experience. Um, and that, that, that stigma is actually promoted by the police and social services in Oakland. So I think one thing to introduce this discussion, which would be helpful, is the concept of how our laws and our legal institution divide victims into deserving and undeserving victims. Um, where um, the deserving victims should be um, provided justice, as, as Wesley explained, but the undeserving victims, um, you know, family members said that the police treated them like criminals and the victim like a number. The term public service murders was used to describe the family member's perception of how the police view the deaths of young black men in Oakland and why the police did not properly investigate them. Even in the laws, so if in, in Oakland um, rejects 20% of all requests for support um, for crime victims, for, for homicide, the family members of homicide victims, they're entitled to government support and assistance. Oakland rejects 20% of those because the families failed to cooperate with the investigation or because the family member is uh, criminal is involved in the criminal justice system in some way, maybe he's on parole. A father being on probation does not lessen his pain over his child's death. It doesn't mitigate his need for assistance and support. And arguably those are the very people that most need assistance and support and are most vulnerable to retaliatory uh, justice, but those are the people denied as a legal matter assistance support, not just in Oakland and in California, but in, in most states in the United States. And then we engage in victim blame. If you ask most academics, why aren't murders solved in East and West Oakland, which I interviewed a number, usually the response will be because the victims refuse to cooperate with the Police, or the community refuses to cooperate with the police. And that to me is a variation of victim blaming. There isn't a deeper examination, which Wesley just kind of offered of why victims, why family members don't cooperate with the police. Security is a real issue. Um, you know, um, you can, in, as a crime victim, you can apply for relocation expense, the support with relocation expenses. If you, if you obtain the maximum amount, it's $2,000. So how are you supposed to relocate to a neighborhood where your young children will be safe because you're testifying in a murder trial with $2,000 in the Bay Area? And if you live in Section 8 housing and your child is murdered, you have to report a decrease in household size and you may lose your housing. Um, because um, you may have to move within 30 days, which is some of the experiences that um, the family members of homicide victims have had in Oakland. So I think that um, the, the concept of deserving and undeserving victims is, isn't extraordinarily detrimental to how we address these, the issues and the implications of violence.
Thank you for that. I want to pivot in our last few minutes to, if possible, talking about solutions and, and, and solving this problem. And I want to go to Lisa. Um, first on this, your work talks a lot about um, state capacity or the lack thereof and how that shapes our ability to handle violence. Today, we've been talking a lot about under protection, but there's also over policing. And so part of what I'm wrestling with is how do we um, build state capacity um, around under protection without expanding the carceral state, right? There's a way in which the, the, the kind of data collection processes that we were advocating might be used for surveillance and other things that people have been fighting for over the last two years as well. So how do we balance those things while building sufficient capacity for solving, preventing and, and, and solving violence? I wish I had an answer. Um, if I may very quickly first just build on something Roxana said, which I think is really important, which is that, you know, if you if you go to these contexts where these homicides with impunity are happening, you know, you you could see these concentric circles of other social risks, right, that people are experiencing. And so to, to just look at a community and say, well, people should cooperate with the police misses, right, the larger ways in which sort of this failure to help people flourish is happening. And then the consequence of that has all, is the ripple effects that then um, you know, that then have these kind of positive feedbacks. I think that's really important. I also very quickly, and I'll, this is gonna circle to your question, Michael, wanted to respond to a question that somebody put in the chat about when I said there's zero accountability for gun violence. I didn't mean nobody's ever held accountable. People go to prison, you know, sometimes in mass shootings, people get killed for, for the shooting. Uh, I mean, politically, it is, it is staggering how few effective public policies are enacted to confront the problem, the persistent problem of devastating gun violence in the United States. Uh, pers just persistent failure of any kind of comprehensive um, uh, gun policy. So, so that, that's, sort of, that's what I meant. And I think that that, that you know, sort of gets to your question, Michael, of how, what kinds of you know, solutions are there and, and how do we try to how do we try to confront the problem of homicide without reifying this, this you know, just brutal and oppressive carceral state um, that that we, which is another form of, of or another other component of state failure. Um, and I don't have any simple answers, but I will say that I I do think we need we need more analysis and a kind of a vision for what effective policing looks like. Um, what what are what are some of these places that are being more effective doing? Um, what, what are some of the ways in which community organizations and other and city services and other um, uh, uh, groups are working together to, to um, produce more accountability and more um, uh, responsiveness? And um, I, I don't know what those are, but I, but I, I think that there are pathways forward. I, I also really think that we do need national standards. I, I share your concern about data collection, but it is, it's, it's not just the, the, the it's not just um, that some of the things Jeff was mentioning. You know, the CDC for decades wasn't was was barred from collecting data on homicides as a public health problem, right? We don't know how many people police kill every year. It, it, I think those are serious problems to the path forward. We need to understand the scope of the problem. We need more data to understand what works. Um, and, I, and I think those are things that have to come from uh, national institutions. We need national standards for policing. We need expectations. We need to know what good police investigative work looks like and who are the kinds of people who are good at that. Uh, and I don't see how we can do that without um, really comprehensive um, data. And, and we have to stop letting police departments get away with the kind of shenanigans that Jeff is talking about. Well, and I, I, I wanna add though, uh, you know, to, to maybe make the point Lisa wasn't trying to make, but I, but, I would, I, but I would argue that I think that there is an argument to be made that there is functionally not accountability for gun violence in this country, not just in the political realm, right? And we can hold two things as true at the same time. There are many people who are incarcerated around gun violence and we know the racial, ethnic, and socioeconomic ways the, that universe of people is going to skew. And also the vast majority of people who commit a gun crime do not ever end up in prison. Good point. And, and, and so that if you look at the totality of gun violence in the United States of America, the vast majority of those incidents do not result in someone in prison for 
for shooting some, right? That when you look at, and, and, and by the way, that data, almost impossible to get a hold of. Right. Go to, to try to get, to try to figure out how many non-fatal shootings, aggregated, aggravated assaults with a gun have happened in a jurisdiction and how many of those resulted in arrest is, is deeply impossible. When I was doing murder with impunity, I sent the request to 50, 50 cities and I got data back from six of them and it was incomplete data. Not all the data I asked for and not for all the years we asked for. But the data that we have shows the extent to which that, that if you are just shot, if you live, there's almost no statistical chance that the person who shoots you is arrested and goes to prison. That in Miami, they make an arrest in one in three homicides, about 33%, but they make an arrest in just one in five non-fatal shootings. So you're down at 20%. In Omaha, it's 18%. In Charlotte, it's 30%. Um, and in Chicago, it's something like 5%. That five out of every hundred shootings results in an arrest. That's the margin of error, right? And so, like, and so again, I think we have to, and I, I think that sometimes when we have this conversation, there's an assumption that no, by noting the failure of the system, it's calling for an expansion of it. But I actually am not positive that's not true. I'm not, I'm not doing one or the other, but, but I'm noting that by pointing out that something is working is not necessarily a call for more of that thing. Um, and in no other context would we ever assume it to be. But in the criminal justice space, when we note that the police don't solve any crimes, we are societally conditioned to believe that that means we just must need more police and to spend more money on police. Um, but I do think it's important to note the failure of police to solve crime and that that doesn't necessarily mean the solution is more police. It's in fact an, an evaluation of how poorly the police who are very well funded are at doing the most fundamental thing that they are supposed to do. So what's the solution then? That's a great question. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> other people on the panel can do that. <laughs> I don't know if the journalist to note in, in the most vivid detail possible the problem. <laughs> not, necessarily, not necessarily figure out the solutions. Well, well, very quickly, Wesley, that I, I do think that um, I do think we need we, we do need to know what what works. And if it involves a little bit more policing or better policing, I think that's important because in the absence yeah. of of, you know, forward thinking solutions, which we are just going to get more of the same. Right. Correct. Which is Correct. and we can't because people people want a response. And so if we don't offer some, some alternative, we are going to just get more bad policing. <laughs> Or more I inefficient. The question is: Is can more policing or better policing solve the problem? So you take the young man who has gone to 19 funerals in Oakland, and let's say that in some of those murders, the perpetrators are caught. Is his is his grief? Is you know his chance of developing developing post traumatic stress disorder? Is his chance to be Gainfully, gainfully employed, is it addressed by capturing the, the perpetrator? I mean, so the folks I interviewed said, no. They said, hurt people hurt people. And what we need is, is a much, is, is greater investment in, in assistance and support um, and not more resources for a police department that already, their budget is 41% of the city budget. I mean, we for decades have been throwing more and more resources at the police. And Wesley, you're right. They're failing in this core function. So the answer is then, you know, they can't do the minimal. So we're going to expect police to solve the problem. I think we have to take a more expansive view of what the problem is. Um, and support community-based organizations that are engaging in violence interruption, that are engaging in social services, that are, you know, addressing some of the concentric social risks, Lisa, that you describe, but not think that more data and more, you know, better policies for how to solve a murder are going to um, reduce, reduce violence. Um, so relying on the police to solve this problem, at least from my city, I think is 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 misplaced. Jeff, where are you on this question? So, uh, I mean, I'm a believer that we should have asked the police or demand that the police apply more investigative resources 
towards solving both murders and non-fatal shootings, which again is not a call for more police. It's not a call for more money for police, but you look at, and I had a piece last summer, I think in the in New York Times on looking at 911 calls and less than 4% in every city, the 10 or 11 cities that we had data for, uh, less than 4% of the time spent was spent on violent crimes. So there's a whole host of things that we ask police to do that we could take over or ask police not to do while also asking them to use those saved resources on investigating shootings and investigating murders. And we know there was this great paper from Anthony Bravga and Phil Cook and Brandon Turchin and Lisa Barreo, I don't know how to pronounce her last name, um, that basically looked at shootings in Baltimore, excuse me, in Boston, and found that within two days, within that 48 hours, about half of the shootings that were solved were solved and half of the murders that were solved were solved. Then they stopped investigating the shootings and they kept investigating the murders and they kept solving more and more murders till they reached that 30, 60 day period where uh, you know, they, they weren't gonna solve anymore. We're gonna solve very few extra murders. Uh, so they're, the only reason that non-fatal shootings don't get solved more often and at the rates that Wesley pointed out is, is because police are not investigating them as much and they're not investigating murders as much as they would need to be. Um, you look at a department that's solving 30 or 40 percent of its murders, let's say 20 percent of those are the ground balls that Wesley talked about, the self-solvers that you have nothing to do. You're really talking about a department that's solving like one in eight or one in four of the murders that it's being asked and tasked to actually investigate. So this is really low, but we have lots of evidence that if you just add more officers and, and have more good officers that are doing this work, you'll solve more of these. And this certainly doesn't answer the problem. It's not the solution to the problem, but it seems like a pre prerequisite towards the better step of how do we fully address this problem holistically. Um, and, it, and again, you know, just saying that police need to do more of this does not mean we need more police and more police officers to do more of this. Uh, it's just asking to, to rejigger and rethink all of the things that we're doing to concentrate on the things that matter most towards protecting society. Well, I don't think they're mutually exclusive, what Jeff and Roxana are saying, right? I mean, these two, there's, you know, both it's of these not. things are necessary, right? Yeah, like, like I thousand percent agree with you, Roxana, that police are, are not, we police centric policy, police centric prevention of violence is not, uh, it's not what people want and it doesn't work. <laughs> um, but at the same time, um, there, there are practices that might do better um, than others, even as we're thinking about state building and sort of investment in ways that might mitigate um, the, the, the violence problem to begin with. So we have two minutes and I want to give each of you um, a, a few seconds to, to, to leave everyone with some final thoughts. You know, what should be the takeaway from this rich conversation from your perspective? Um, Wes? Sure. Like I said, I, I, I often think about these things through the lens of legitimacy. And I think that from a, no matter what we can prove as it relates to legitimacy or not, I think as a philosophical uh, exercise, I think it's important. But again, you know, a homicide, a murder, a shooting, these are among the worst crimes someone can commit uh, against them. And if the police cannot secure justice in those circumstances, what does that say about the legitimacy of the police? Um, and, and, and what does that say? And, and, and can I blame someone who then finds them or believes them to be illegitimate? Uh, that, that when we look at the communities that have the least trust of the police, um, it's not just the communities that are the most violent, but are the communities where the people are the most victimized. Um, and that in this contract, um, because I also do my journalism through power analysis, right? The, the, the police are powerful, uh, that the taxpayers pay for this service. And if the service is not what they paid for, um, it, it's not a, well, but you also could have gotten to the restaurant a few minutes earlier. Well, that doesn't change the fact that the fish is undercooked. Um, and, and so the American citizens, no matter who they are, uh, no matter their community, whether it be rich or poor, violent or, or safe, right? Every American citizen deserves a country where they, where they are safe from violence and, and where they are delivered the justice that's promised them. And I think as long as we don't have that, 
um, the, we will continue to deal with a real legitimacy crisis uh, around policing. Thank you, Jeff. I mean, as Wesley's a journalist, I'm a data person, so I see everything as a data problem. Um, and a lot of times I, I think about these problems and apply it to baseball, where if you can imagine trying to evaluate a baseball season where you get data about eight or nine months after the season ended, so maybe you get data on the 2021 baseball season in July of 2022, and only 22 of the 30 teams reported data. Now go evaluate what happened in the baseball season. And so, I, I mean, I think that it's this, the, that's what the, the reality is in crime and murder and just not just murder, but gun violence and shootings. And we had this historic increase in gun violence last year and we have no way of understanding it. So, you know, if, if anybody that, that's listening is, has any sway or any ability to ask and, and demand of their, their cities and their departments to collect and, and produce better data quickly, it's, it's essential and it's a big challenge that we're facing that makes it virtually impossible to solve this problem. Roxana? Can I just say ditto? <laughs> <So> <laughs> yes, Wesley had a sign off. Um, so I would say that um, if we're going to our vocational corners, I view this these issues as a human rights lawyer and a human rights researcher. And when um, impunity is as systemic as it is in Oakland, one thing that I kind of point out in the report is um, you arguably have the United States violating its international human rights obligations. And I wanted to underscore that and just re-emphasize that impunity is a concept that's not just about catching the perpetrator, but also about preventing the violence and providing support and assistance to the family members. And I wanted to end with the words of the family members because you know one thing that my study tried to do is really center their words and their perspective because it's so often missing from the from the policy deb debate about policing or criminal justice or public safety. And one of the really interesting respondents um, was a mother whose son was killed who had worked for in the, in the prison systems for 33 years. And so we asked every respondent, what does justice mean to you? And she responded in part, if we provide assistance to families, to victims, then we have a unique opportunity to change um, the path of someone's life so they don't have to carry a weapon, so that they don't have to commit the cr a crime. Maybe they're working before the in incident happened. The incident occurred, they lost their job. Now they don't have any financial support, right? Pro we need investments in programs and strategies and direct investment into families, into those community organizations that are serving. These victims should be a high priority. Lisa? Well, in my vocation, we call that state building. And I would like to leave it on with those words, Roxana. Thank you very much. Thank you all, um, the panelists, for your brilliant insights um, and a great conversation. And thank you um, to everyone who attended today. Um, take care. <laughs>